you know, and, and a lot of uh, economists use as well, to think about kind of problems and situations in the world in general. And it's called the economic way of thinking. Uh, so I was wondering if you could introduce us to that idea and then we can start exploring about how it applies to diet. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of things that fall under the idea of the economic way of thinking. Um, and, and I think at its most basic, there's a couple of things, right? The, 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 the most basic part of the economic way of thinking is recognizing the omnipresence of scarcity, right? That, that uh, we can't get everything we want, uh, and that what that means is any choice we make, we have, well, one, we have to choose between the things, the multiple things we might want, and that any choice we make involves a cost, right? That, that um, there are lots of kinds of things we might want to do in life or things we might want to purchase or, or whatever, whatever you know, we're thinking about, whatever goals we have, whatever, whatever ends that we have. Uh, but that, that all of those involve, again, make, we have to make choices. We can't uh, do all the things we want to do. There's not enough time. There's not enough resources. So we have to make, we have to make choices. And the economic way of thinking recognizes that uh, human life really is defined by the necessity of choice and the fact and scarcity. And so one of so the idea of scarcity, of course, is a key concept in economics and the economic way of thinking. But the other thing that, that goes with that is the idea of opportunity cost, right? That uh, that when you make a choice, you're giving up something else, right? The op what we call opportunity cost is that choice that you forego, right? That if you decide, uh, you know, you right. decided to spend an hour and fifteen minutes with us tonight here uh, on Big Event, Big Ideas Live, you could have been doing something else on Facebook. You could have been watching. House of Cards, you could have been doing pretty much anything, but you made this choice, and what you gave up is the opportunity cost. And if we really want to be specific, what you've given up, it, you don't even know what it is you've given up because you gave it up, right? So when we talk technically about opportunity cost, what we're really talking about is the uh, expected subjective utility of what you thought was the next best choice. So if, right. you know, if your, your choice tonight really was watching House of Cards, your opportunity cost of spending the hour and 15 minutes with us is what you imagined you would get from watching House of Cards. And since you don't actually watch it, you don't know for sure. Could have been a great episode, could have been a terrible episode. You, you don't know. We might be great, we might be terrible. Right? <laughs> the, 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 the necessity of choice is a world of expectations, right? When we choose, we choose based on those expectations. And the second piece of the economic way of thinking is the idea that when we choose, we choose uh, on the margin, as economists say, right? That we choose between one specific thing and another specific thing. So tonight, to stay with our example, right, you're, you're choosing between this episode of Big Ideas Live mm -hmm. and the episode of House of Cards you would have watched next. If I say, you know, you made this choice, which, you know, which, which do you think, you know, which one do you prefer, you're not choosing House of Cards in general, you're not choosing big ideas live in general. You're making a choice on the margin. How do I spend the next hour with an hour of this or an hour of that? So when we think, my, my favorite example of this comes from the economic way of thinking textbook. The example they use there is a student who's studying for a big physics exam and, and his friends say, hey, you know, come out, go to the bar with us, right? And the student says, says no, I have to study for my physics exam tonight. I can't. And the friends say, oh, well, you must love physics more than you love us. And the friend's response is, on the margin, yes, right? <laughs> Which means tonight, right now, today, this right, choice, right? I, that's, what, that's, what I need, um, that's what I need to do. So, uh, so in any case, uh, I think that, you know, that is key to the economic, to the economic way of thinking. Um, and, and so understanding that when we do choose, that's, that's how we're choosing. So, uh, so the combination of the, the, uh, the, the idea that, that we have to choose and that we choose on the margin really defines, uh, defines the economic way of thinking. So uh, with that in mind, there's one other thing I guess that we should, we should or one other way we should think about this, which is uh, if, we, if we think about the idea that we are always choosing facing constraints, right? That the world, the opportunities out there in the world uh, give us uh, uh, a set of, of, of constraints that we have to deal with, and that those constraints, those the, the sort of reality of that world, uh, means that when we choose, we can't get, we can't get all the things we want. We're faced with limited resources, with limited time, with, with whatever. Right. So in the case of, of diet, to narrow it down a little bit uh, to what we're talking about tonight, um, some, some good examples of uh, opportunity costs might be, you know, if you choose well, like say, say you're trying to be healthy, that like this is uh, just 
from my own personal experience, which we'll talk about whether or not you can generalize from a personal experience. Uh, say you really want to, you know, go out for drinks with your friends, or you and you really want to have some birthday cake or ice cream cake or something. You're gonna like. You can't choose to have both of those things and to stay healthy, right? Or maybe you can make another choice, uh, like I could choose to go for a run or something like that. Um, so that that's kind of how opportunity costs, I mean, to some extent, right? Like yeah. it, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that yeah. uh, applies. But in terms of constraints, um, how would you say that constraints really ap apply when it comes to uh, thinking about diet and exercise? Like what's an well, example of that? Well, you know, we, we I mean, whatever we know of the science, for example, of, of, of food and of diet, and again, one of the points that we, you know, want to bring out yeah, is that that yeah, science, science is, you know, we hear conflicting things all the time from different people about, about what, about, you know, what, what's best for you and what's not best for you, but we certainly know you well, need to have a minimum number of calories to stay alive, you, right. you know, if you, if you, if you, uh, you know, every meal includes 12 beers. That's probably a bad idea. Um, you know, so so we know that there's certain there's certain facts of the world, right, that we have to deal with, uh, and we know if you know if you overeat consistently, odds are pretty good that that you know you're gonna you're you're gonna put on weight. So those are constraints, right? But we we choose you know within those constraints, and we have preferences about what we'd rather do. I mean, take your example, you know. We, we all might, you know, one might want to eat healthy, but one also wants to be part of a party and wants to enjoy a good, you know, birthday right. cake from time to time, right? So we know that we, we have the cake possibility, but we also know if we eat too much of it, you know, other things are going to happen. So we, we have those right. those realistic constraints that we face, the, the facts of the world, um, and we have preferences, and we have to, you know, figure out what are we willing to tolerate and what are we willing to accept. And, and as you say... We might make one choice one day and another choice another day that looks that looks a little little bit different. But all, again, all of those choices are 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 our preferences being subjected to the the realities of the world. Right, and um, I mean, even within I, I for sure, certainly we've got preferences. I'm uh, a little bit famous with a group of people that Steve knows for not really being a big fan of cake. Uh, which some people find really upsetting. I'd rather eat a pound of chicken wings personally, but I mean that's totally different from me to the other people that uh, or other people that are out there, I should say, um, and that that's going to factor in as well, uh, certainly. And um, in addition to that, I mean some people can certainly eat more, right, uh, and get away with it, <laughs> um, and yes. other people can't, right? So you've got to you've got to not only take into account your preferences, but also uh, just the personal right. realities that affect only you, right? And and that's another and that's another form of constraint, right? Another kind of constraint that we you know our preferences are subject to is knowing our own bodies and the ability, you know, sort of how our own bodies trade off one thing against another. You know, just as an example, I'm not a small person, but I'm a lightweight with alcohol, right? I have a couple of drinks and you know I'm I'm out of it, um, and and that's just the way my body processes alcohol, but. I, you know, you know people who are much smaller than me who can drink a lot more and be, be perfectly fine. Um, the same way different people process different kinds of foods. I have a slight bit of high blood pressure. And when I went to my doctor, when, when, when my doctor I'm talking about, I said, do I need to cut down on salt? And his answer was, well, <laughs> it depends on, you know, people's bodies are different, right? You're going to find out if you, if you cut down on salt, you might reduce your blood pressure, but you might not. It might be that you're just not very salt sensitive or you are very salt sensitive. Turns out I'm not salt sensitive, so it doesn't make a difference one way or the other. But for some people, it really does. And, I, and so I right. think when we think about what do you eat and how do you stay healthy, one of the facts of the world, those constraints that we have to take into account, is our own bodies and how our own bodies react to things. And so, again, as we think about you know applying the economic way of thinking to how we think about food and how we think about what to eat, that's you know that's a good example is knowing that, that we have certain preferences, whether it's over types of food or losing weight or whatever, but to execute those preferences, we need to know what, what, the, what the reality is we're bumping up against. All right. Um, I'm going to pause right now and give people a, a chance to ask questions because I think this is a really important uh, concept that we're talking about. And while I do, I've got a, uh, a poll that people can participate in. Uh, so I hope you guys should see it pop up. And uh, I'll see when you vote. So I'll give you a few minutes to vote and ask questions. Um, so far, most of what I'm getting, uh, well, most, I've got some support for the idea that cake is overrated, which, uh, <laughs> which I'm a fan of. 
Um, it, it's funny. Favorite. I was just having this conversation eating cake Sunday night at dinner with my daughter, who also thinks it's overrated. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a time and a place for cake, just like most things. <laughs> um, so I've got about 44% of people in. Uh, some support for your daughter's opinion on cake. <laughs> um, excellent. And uh, Steve, since uh, I'm not getting any questions yet on the economic way of thinking, which is great because I'll take that as uh, an, the idea that people are generally on board, um, maybe I'll give you a chance to say anything that you think needs to be said on that before we move on. Well, I mean, I'm, you know, I think if you understand the idea of scarcity and opportunity cost, I think if you understand, I, and maybe it's worth emphasizing again, the idea that value is subjective, right? That 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 what um, you know, understanding that economic decision making is is about achieving about the best ways to achieve the ends that we value, and different people value different things, right? So, uh, you know, again, if we think in terms of food, some people want to be skinny and and sort of think that that's the path to living the longest life possible other people say I'm willing to give up a few years of longevity to you know eat those buffalo wings or <laughs> or whatever it might be um, so again what our ends are what our goals are, are different and 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 you know we uh, the the way in which each of us each of us place value on different goals is different obviously and that and that I think matters for how we how we think about food um, what this suggests is that there's a really important difference between what we might call economic efficiency, that is, getting the, the most value out of something, right? Uh, you know, making sure that marginal benefits greatly exceed marginal cost, and technological efficiency. Um, you know, just knowing what is the most, you know, a, for example, we can imagine a, creating a car that gets 100 miles to a gallon, right? We, it would, but the question is, one, what would it cost? Two, yeah. what would it, you know, how heavy and safe would it be? Not very, right? And people simply wouldn't want it because miles per gallon isn't the only thing people care about, right? There's, there's trade-offs all over the place. So understanding that point and understanding that, that the economic way of thinking looks at the relationship between means and ends and not just the kind of, you know, technological idea that there's one sort of physical goal that we have to achieve. Right. All right, uh, so just uh, in case anybody's curious, most people think that the economic way of thinking can be applied in most situations. We've got a few people that think it depends, and we've got a few people that says that you, you should be applying it all the time. So they're the real hardcore, I yep. guess. Um, Gary just, uh, to get you, <laughs> just to give everybody an idea of uh, maybe where you stand. Um, so, okay, uh, let's uh, focus in a little bit more on diet, um, even though we've kind of started already. Uh, if you have met Steve or I before, or you meet us in the future, um, we can't help ourselves. We love food, which is why this is uh, such a fun event, I hope, for both of us to be doing. Um, but I thought diet would be a really good topic because people have so many opinions on it. It can be really, really confusing. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have, like, one rule. So, for instance, you stop eating fat, or you stop eating carbs, or you drink three liters of water a day. There are a bunch of things like people have the kind of one rule that if you do this, you'll be healthy and you'll be able to maintain a good weight. Um, but a lot like those recommendations can be conflicting, right? The people who say cut out fat generally think that you should be eating like whole grain carbs. Right. Not always, I don't want to misrepresent anybody's point of view. And a lot of the people who don't like, or who like to eat lots of fat, um, do it by cutting out carbs completely, uh, which, I tried once and I just love potatoes way too much. Uh, so it just doesn't work for me personally, which kind of goes back to what we were saying. Right. Um, so Steve, why do you think there are so many mixed signals? I mean, we talked about the fact that there are some experts, but it yeah. seems like it's still confusing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, a couple of things. We, we well, many things. <laughs> well, <laughs> one is bodies are different, right? I mean, you know, and, and I think that, that oftentimes, even though, we're all human beings, and, and in some sense, we all share the same physical mechanism. Different bodies process things differently sometimes, and I think they're, you know, for some people, eliminating one thing works. For other people, eliminating another thing works. Uh, and and sort of, you know, what what nutritionists and dietitians and scientists know often depends upon, you know, what they're looking for, how they set up the the various, you know, various experiments or studies they do. And again, I'm not I'm not denying that there's that science is relevant here. I think it is. But but we get 
as you say, sort of multiple results. Uh, and, and if you think about even in the last, say, 10 or 20 years, how many diet fads we've gone through where everyone keeps saying, oh, the science shows that you need Atkins. The science shows you need low fat. Does cholesterol lead to heart disease? Yes, no, yes. No. So I mean, <laughs> part of the scientific process itself is figuring out what works and what doesn't. And so we're, you know, we don't need to necessarily go there, but the analogies to other issues in the news, you know, are, might be relevant here. Whether the science is, is complete or not, right? Science is never complete, right? We just, we're always trying to figure this out. So we learn new things year after year, especially as our you know, real understanding of the micro processes go on. So, so I think that's, that's part of it. And, and then, as you said, Janet, you know, people have preferences. And, and a, a diet or nutrition recommendations, whatever they are, are no good if you're not going to stick to them. Right. So, right. so part, so, for, you know, some things work for some people because psychologically they're just better able to do that. And again, knowing your own body the, and, and sort of those objective constraints and knowing your own preferences, you've got to figure out how those match. Yeah. And uh, another thing that might be worth uh, thinking about is I actually didn't know how much I would miss potatoes. Um, I love cheese. I love bacon. I was like, this is a diet where what, I can eat all exactly the cheese. What exactly don't you love? Jack? That's the real question. <laughs> but uh, there's there's a uh, there's a funny there's a funny video on the internet where it got there are many funny videos on the internet, but there's one in which um, the guy kind of makes a joke. He says, "Except you have to you can have all the butter and all the bacon and all the cheese." And all you have to do is give up bread and potatoes. He's like, what is the all you have? He says, right. so you can have all of these things if you take away all the things they go with. And it turns out that's the way that I feel. So I couldn't, I couldn't stick with it. But other people really right. can. And I think right. that that's great for them. Um, but again, it just it, it shows that not only do I not know what works for them, um, but I didn't even know what worked for yeah. me. Yep. Uh, so it, it can be it can be really confusing. And I think uh, something that we might want to talk a little bit about is whether you should, when something works for you, how much you can assume that it will help somebody else. Uh, yeah. Because you definitely get this in personal relationships. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, everybody, everybody who, had, who finds a diet that works, well, I shouldn't say everybody, people who find diets that work, right, you know, they get asked about it, they want, you know, they want to talk about it, they're very proud of themselves, perhaps as they should be, and they want to share it. And I think you just have to recognize that, that, you haven't found the one right answer any more than if you know if I go buy a particular brand of car or breakfast cereal or whatever else, it's not the one right answer. I, I love my Nissan Altima, but it's not like I think it's the best car for everybody because not you know people people like different kinds of cars, but people might need a bigger or smaller car or whatever. So, I, but there there is I mean part of the problem here I think is that um, we've. We, we have moralized food in a bunch of different ways, right? Uh, certainly, environmental issues are part of this. Uh, you know, people who are vegetarians, let's say, for environmental reasons, to them, it's a, there's deep moral issues there. I think for other people who make other diet choices, uh, feel as though, you know, they're doing something like a, you know, Religion substitute is strong, but at least it has this moral component to it. And I think they feel like, you know, I have to bring this to other people. Look what I found. Here, here it is. But the reality, again, is that, that just because it worked for you doesn't mean it's going to work for other people. And that's a kind of paternalist instinct, I think, that, that we see in lots of other places in society where people assume, you know, this, is, this was right for me, therefore it must be right for everyone else. And I think there's some of that that goes on with diet. Uh, you know, I've, been, I've dropped 10, 15 pounds in the last few months following a diet. And if people ask me, I'll tell them about it. But I don't know if it's going to work for them. I, you know, it worked for me because it weirdly matches my psychology for some strange you know, reason. <laughs> But, but that's me, and it, it might or might not work for you. I mean, my doctor, thank God, ha every time I go see him, gives me, you know, one or two new diets he's heard about, and he says, go try this, right, or think about trying this. And we finally, finally hit one, right, because, again, what, what works with some people doesn't, doesn't work with others. Yeah, and that you kind of touched a little bit on a, uh, on a gray area there because um, I certainly don't know, uh, I couldn't tell everybody who's listening today um, what would work for them. But maybe if I know someone really, really well, I might be able to tailor my advice to them. Yeah. And, I, and it sounds like your doctor is willing to work with you. And so you kind of get this thing where you can't really say that nobody knows what will work for you. Yeah. Because if you know someone really well, 
yep. you might you might know that. Um, and I mean that that really does feed into I think the, the like as you said the paternalistic instinct. Um, and another another thing that uh, maybe we can talk about a little bit is uh, if I if I make a decision kind of for you and I say well Steve I know how you can lose even more weight. Um, you can give up potatoes and bread and eat all the cheese and bacon you want. And I can think that that's great. I don't bear the cost of you, that you feel when you're doing that. So right. do, you, do you have anything maybe to say about that? Well, I mean, yeah, I think, I think sometimes, yeah, you certainly can know people well enough to, to make, to, to be more, to have more kind of intimate knowledge of them that enables you to suggest things that you think might work. Um, and, and, you know, money, politics, and religion and diet maybe right you know with close friends you sometimes want to be careful um, but you know again if people ask me about what I'm doing I'll tell them but that doesn't there's no right there's no there's no guarantee there um, but that's different from total strangers right and when we think you know the, the sort of question one of the things we learn when we think about the economic way of thinking is that these decisions people have to make are often so idiosyncratic to their own preferences and their own constraints I mean one example I use all the time is the decision of how Dual income couples with kids will work out their child care. There's not just no one right answer. They all figure it out their own particular ways based on their own circumstances and, and their own attempts to sort of match their preferences against their constraints. I think the same is true here too, right? There's all kinds of ways to do this. And when we start trying to boss strangers around, we just have no clue, right, what it is that 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 uh, will work for them. And and even as well as you know someone, right? You still don't presumably know them as well as they know themselves, and so I think you know, being being careful about the kinds of of, of the assumption of one right answer, one right way, and one size fits right. all. That's that's the real caution. Yeah, I I I totally agree. And actually, to build on that, um, not only are things very personal, um, but they're time dependent as well. Yeah. Uh, so what's working for you right now? And just so you guys know, he really is like the amazing shrinking Horowitz right now. Uh, he looks great. Just so you can all appreciate it. Uh, but one thing that he's talked about when uh, when we've talked about this is you don't know if what you're doing now is something that you want to continue doing forever. Yeah. Um, it's very right now you're trying to you have a specific goal uh, for your diet and in the future you might not have the same goal or maybe you'll figure out it works. Um, but even if I know you really well and I know that this will work for you, I don't know what's going to work for you in a year or two years. Right. And that really complicates things even even more. It's it's basically <laughs> it's almost impossible actually <laughs> for well, for me to know or even for you yeah. to know. Uh, right, really. right. And yeah, I mean be in a very different circumstance a year or two from now and and one diet that helps you say lose weight or you know helps you lower your cholesterol or whatever your goal. And and notice by the way, right, losing weight isn't the only goal one might have with a diet, right? For other people it's not about weight. It's about putting on muscle or it's it's controlling, you know, blood sugar or whatever it might be. And, and yeah. we don't even want to get into allergies and intolerances and all that stuff, right? So, right. so but what, what might work for me to lose if I'm you know, 20 pounds or whatever might not be the same thing that works for me to maintain that weight once I achieve it. So again, you know, it, 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 these things are, are, are all subjective in context and, 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 you know, time or context dependent and, and, and just depends upon where, where you are and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, where do you think uh, the, I mean, I, th I think it comes a little bit from, you know, when something works for me, I can, I get excited about it and I want to, yeah. I want to share it with people for sure. Um, but I, wanting to share it with your friends isn't really the same kind of impulse that makes you want to share something with the whole world. Um, where do you yeah. think that, that that comes from? Well, I think the, the sort of share it with the whole world and, and that, you know, what we more critically would call paternalism. It you know, often comes out from a good place, right? People people really think they have an answer about how to improve people's lives, and and especially when you know it's something that people say, I want to be better at, I want to be healthier, I I don't, I don't want you know I want a diet that'll lower my blood pressure or you know lower my cholesterol or whatever it might be, um, and so people say that, and I think other people often are well intentioned in thinking, well, I did it using this, therefore I want to help you. This must be must be the way to do it, and I think you know. Often it's 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 uh, making the simplifying assumption that every you know, everyone's the same, everyone's in the same context. Uh, therefore, right? I mean, you, again, think about something like automobile purchases. You know, people say, "Oh, well, you have to buy a hybrid." 
right? Because it's good for the environment. Well, that's okay. You know, maybe it is. That's a question. Yeah, but even if it is, not everyone has that same goal. Other people have different trade-offs that they might want to make with gas mileage or environment, you know, or, or protection or whatever it might be. So a part of the problem, I think, is assuming that folks have a, the identical goal that you do uh, and that they're in the same kind of situation to, to achieve it in the same way that you have. Um, okay, so I've, I've got some great questions coming in and they're sort of going to lead us into what I want to talk about next. So why don't we take a lot of time to answer them um, okay. and I'll just kind of use them to springboard. Sure. Uh, so uh, Laurel is asking, do you, Hi, think Laurel. That, <laughs> do you think that fads are more harmful or deceptive than simply eating in moderation? Or do you think that, uh, and I'm, I'm now elaborating, or do you think that there's kind of a place for something like fads in the way that people make decisions for themselves? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm not, I, you know, here, the real, let me back up a step and say what I think the real problem is, which is determining whether something's a fad or not, right? I mean, that's, that's the real problem is how do you yeah. know it's a fad versus actually we've learned something here, right? And so right, in some sense, in some sense... Rock music was going to be a fad with the Beatles, right? Right, exactly. It'll go yeah. right, you know, right. So, the internet. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it might be interesting to think about fads as being kind of the leading edge of something, right? I mean, it, you know, I think we have learned something from things like Atkins that, that carbs are a problem, right? I mean, you know, you don't have to go all the way to no carbs or think they're the, you know, positive evil to recognize that, yeah, eating a lot of that, that you know, processed wheat or whatever grains is, is, is a problem. Sugar, too. So, okay, but we learned something from it. And rather than treat the fads as being the answer, recognize that maybe often they make a contribution to making a more sophisticated understanding of, of, of what's really going on here. Um, you know, I, I, so, so in that sense, I, I don't think fads are, 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 are a bad thing. I think that, you know, people get caught up in them. I, I don't know the literature well enough to know the answer to the question I'm going to pose, but it certainly does seem like, again, anecdotally, that people who jump on, quote, fad diets often will lose lots of weight, but if you come check back in five or ten years, where are they? Right? Now, again, some people keep it off, some people don't. Right. And, and that's why, I mean, you know, at least my experience is, and certainly it seems logical to me that the, the best kinds of diet are behavioral change, right? Where, where, you, where it's not necessarily about what you're eating, though that might matter, but about learning to how, how change your relationship with food, as you know, some people say, right? Or, or, or change your eating habits in a way that by changing your behavior is more likely to stick than simply jumping on a particular set of food as being really good or really bad. Again, this, th there's science all over the map here. So I think I think we paying attention. You know, don't dismiss fads, but I think you have to find a way to integrate them into a to a broader picture. Well, right, and I mean the way that we with anything, including diets, the way that we learn what works and what mm -hmm. doesn't is generally trying it, right? Um, yeah. And also like. There, All, first article. movers always bear kind of, uh, they're not only bearing the extra uncertainty, but I mean, w along with that comes the possibility of a cost, right? So you might be able to drop a bunch of weight really quickly, but as your body adjusts, or not to get into too much because right. I, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the literature. Right. I mean, I've read a lot, but um, most of what I've read has convinced me that I should um, defer in a lot of cases to an expert because it's yeah. it's so all over the map, and I'm just I'm just not familiar with the uh, the full body right. of the knowledge. And it's a to use a kind of Hayekian phrase here. It's a discovery process, right? I mean, we're, yeah. you know, we're 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 trying to figure out what works and what doesn't for us. And I, I'm going to tackle the second half of Laurel's question because again, sure. um, I, you know, I'm a great believer, and it's not just about diet, it's about everything in the sort of idea of everything in moderation, including moderation, right? So, so you know, it, it's, it's, it's okay to splurge and, you know, do this and that once in a while, but you just got to recognize that you can't live that way, right? So whatever, and, and I think what we learn from all these fads is, is that there's, there's trade-offs all over the place here, right? If you decide to go to you know, the high fat, no carbs diet, you might be saving yourself one thing, but you might well be risking, you know, something else, right? So, uh, and if you, if you go to the, you know, uh, let's eat more carbs and eliminate the fat, right, you're trading off something else. So, and, 
So, and if you go on a diet, you know, where you're eating, uh, let me just to make this up, right? You know, uh, where where you're where you're, uh, you know, a diet that doesn't have much salt in it, you're missing out on flavor, and that might matter to you. So, so again, there, there's trade-offs all over the place in terms of both the health and your own subjective preferences. Again, I think that whenever we talk about food or any of these kinds of things, if you're not happy doing what you're doing, it's just not going to work. And what makes you happy is going to vary from person to person. Um, okay, kind of a, uh, a related question, and after this question I'll bring up the poll uh, because the, I've got a couple more questions that really lead into what I wanted to talk about next, um, which uh, I don't want to jump the gun too much. Uh, but somebody asked kind of a more specific question on what we were just talking about, which is, um, are public overreactions to new information like fad diets part of the natural process of the general public incorporating new information? That's a great question, and and, it, and you know I think it, it might well be. I don't have a theory of 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 you know sort of fads, right? But it seems to me that 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 yeah. I mean, I think here's the other part of the problem too. I think I think people jump on the fads because everybody wants the magic bullet, right? Everyone wants the pill. That means that they can eat whatever they want and not gain weight. That's what we all like. But that that's that's the world that's free of scarcity and choice and constraint. That's the world where the economic way of thinking doesn't matter if you can just do that, right? The real world is a world which we have to decide, you know, what what we think is going to work for us. And so I, I do think that's one of the reasons why those fads get jumped on so quickly is, oh, this is the thing, right? If we just, you know, if we can just find that drug that blocks the fat creation in cells or whatever, right? We can, you know, but you know, it's that that's 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 a hopeless dream. I do think one other thing I'll I don't know if we'll throw it in here, I guess, but I do think it's interesting that you know in the nineteen fifties the vision of food in the future was everyone would take these pills and get all their nutrition, right, and be healthy and never actually eat or cook anything. And and that's it. I mean, we're still looking for that. And then when you think about how stupid is that vision, right? How 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 much does that vision deny one of life's great pleasures, which is cooking and eating right, all this right. wonderful stuff that you and I love, right? It's just stupid. And in fact, what's really interesting is we become wealthier, we actually spend more time. Right? What 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 are can rich people afford? Slow food, right? So so right. that vision got it exactly backwards, which is people love good food and love to eat. And that means we're very conscious about thinking about all these fads because we don't want to give up the food. We want to keep eating and enjoying yeah. things. We just want to know how to do it more sensibly. Well, and I, I mean, that's really a case, I think, of um, you've got people like at the time that they came up with that theory, right? Cooking took up a lot of time. And if you yeah. are, if you are um, not wealthy enough, to, I mean, cooking is expensive yeah. in time. Right, you need to find it, it. You need to find recipes. You need to find ingredients. You need to actually dedicate the time that it takes to cook. Um, a lot of people don't have that, and I mean, it's great that it's become normal that food is something that you enjoy and you you yeah. grow it and all of the all of these things that used to be a chore are now right. kind of a luxury. Right, we're um, we're to use a line I've used before. We're rich enough to play at being poor, right? Yes. By by growing our own food in the backyard and raising chickens and right. It's not like it, it's not a survival tactic yeah. now. It's it's a luxury good. Right? Uh, but and meanwhile, the the kind of like utopian dream of, uh, I I mean the pills. There's also um, if you read about it that Soylent stuff yeah, yeah. that, that yeah. there's uh, I I don't know I I'm not going to remember the whole story. Everyone it's basically, should, if, yeah, if, if people don't watch. know about it, you should Google it because it's interesting. Right. But it's this guy has come up with this as far as I can tell, sort of tasteless goo that provides everything that you need. And so he just stopped eating. He doesn't enjoy eating. He didn't he thought it was kind of a waste of time. So he's got like a cup of Soylent, which is named after Soylent Green, which is a little bit um, yeah, a little creepy if you know them. A little bit creepy, but I mean, whatever. You know, it's a, it's a fun pop culture reference, I guess. But he drinks this stuff and that's all he needs to do and that would drive me bonkers. No. No, um, who wants to live but like? for him he doesn't mind. Right. And I mean, for a lot of people, if you could make it taste better, that actually might if if you're working three jobs yeah. to like just pay your bills, yeah. it might be good if you could like literally because I mean some people say have a smoothie instead of eating. I can't do that. I'm just no. then I'm like now I've had a smoothie and I'm still hungry. But but I'm, some people can do that right and and it would be helpful for those people. But right. it's really what? our our definition of what is um, 
of what utopia is even has changed. Right. Well, again, I'm not sure. If, you know, if, I don't know if this is where you want to go, but but you know, imagine imagine there was this magical place where you could go, and not get even out of your car, and you know, in five minutes for five dollars, get yourself a complete, nutritious, healthy, pretty reasonably by historical standards, nutritious, healthy meal with a uh, protein and some carbs. Right? Mm. Magical place, right? There's, there's, you know, there's five on every street. And, and again, if you're poor and you're time constrained, that's, those are other options. Other options too. Okay. So one one last thing I was thinking about with oh, the pill ahead. stuff. Yeah, with the pill stuff too, and it ties to the fads, which is that pill stuff was about sort of, you know, a belief in the power of science, right? That it was, yeah. um, you know, science will solve all our problems. We just little magic pill. The scientists tell us it makes us healthy. I think. That's as much of a problem with the fads now as, as anything else, right? That that the we you know we the fads are the new version of the pills in the sense that it's we're, we're looking for science to tell us the answer and they go oh, now you should go carb free or now you should go you know what paleo or whatever, right? There's the new answer. So yeah. Okay, I'm just I'm gonna bring up uh, our next poll uh, and I'm just reviewing the questions and they're all great. It's like you guys uh, know where we're going with this. <laughs> um, so I'll give you all a few minutes to uh, to vote here. This is just kind of uh, I'm just kind of curious where you guys stand on this uh, and I'll, I'll let everybody know um, sort of where the crowd is on this. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, well, I've got I've got one um, one question and comment from someone who's actually a dietitian. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for listening, uh, and uh, I, I appreciate your feedback. And she says weight loss has a 98% give or take fail rate at two years out in the yeah. current model. Diet is so ingrained that it may be more a question of the magnitude of. Uh, Sorry, I, I'm, I'm just having a hard time. I, basically, diet is like so ingrained in the way that we do things, in the way that we live, um, that it's it's really a hard choice to make. Uh, and the government makes recommendations, but not everybody knows them. And so should nutrition facts be mandated on manu at a manufacturer level? Uh, that's from Heather. And I've also got, oh, I'm, I'm not going to... I'm sorry, I have somebody who asked this question first, and I'm going to butcher his, his name if I try, so I'm, I'm not going to try, but thank you for your question. But it's the same kind of question. What do you think of government forcing companies to put nutritional facts on their products? Is it not a big deal? Is it useful? Uh, are the, what are the consequences? Um, so kind of let's, let's talk a little bit about um, yeah. when diet is such a personal choice and something that becomes so ingrained, and like you said, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. Um, how do how can the government uh, talk uh, contribute by uh, letting us know about guidelines or even mandating nutritional labels? Yeah, uh, on things. You know, I mean, look, of all the things that governments do, is is, is mandating that manufacturers put you know nutritional facts or ingredients or whatever or allergy warnings, which is a whole different thing, on their on their you know products. That, it, that's to me not a big deal among all the things governments do. It's not, I think, a couple of problems we can raise about it though. Are one, going back to our earlier discussion, if you're going to put nutritional facts on a label, that presumably, in, you know, you're making, you're, you're using some kind of theory about which things contribute what to nutrition and what the appropriate calorie count is. So you're assu making assumptions about what a good diet looks like or what the relevant information is that you want to have on those. So it might be right, but it might not. So are, are the things that governments say people have to put on their products really the things that that matter? And again, go back to our earlier conversation. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to lose weight, trying to cut down on salt? You know, how do you know that the things they're asking firms to do are the things that customers really want, or that the buyers really want or need? You know, but okay, if you're so those are problems, um, and, and I think ingredient lists. You know, if if you're when you know, assuming you're not an anarchist libertarian, right? It, you can make an argument, I think, that right. says listing one's ingredients are one way of you know from, to ensure that firms aren't defrauding you by what they're what they're you know, what they're doing. And, but that said, it would seem to me firms would have sellers would have very powerful reasons to want to list their ingredients, and anyone who didn't right. would have maybe difficult time selling their product. 
And I think we've come to that, by the way, with allergy information too now. I agree. Put, put aside whether you think everybody really has a peanut allergy or gluten or whatever it might be. Assume for the moment these things are sufficiently real, okay? And even if they're not as real as they seem, they're still out there. They're, harsh, they're right. real for some people. You know, if you don't put now on your thing or list potential allergens, people aren't going to buy it because there's so many people who are sensitive to so many different things, whether it's gluten or lactose or whatever, right? That, that you know, uh, the, the competitive pressure to put that information on would be there even if it weren't mandated. And the interesting thing about using the process of competition in this way is that that we find out what people really care about and whether or not the, what's mandated is really the things that people want to know. Yeah, um, I, 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 I agree. I think that um, it's, like you said, allergies, just allergies alone um, to avoid the, the lawsuits and just to get people to buy it, right? If yeah. you've got a, if, if you have somebody in your family who's got a really serious allergy and they're definitely out there, um, you're not going to buy something. Like, that's why they've got the peanut, like nobody says you have, I don't think anybody says that you have to put a peanut free label on chocolate bars, right? But right. now at Halloween, like it's impossible to find anything with peanut butter in it because everybody's got, <laughs> which right. is a real pet peeve for those of us who love chocolate and peanut butter, by the way. Well, um, well there's one we disagree on because I, I, <laughs> yeah, I know. And don't keep your peanut butter out of my chocolate. <laughs> but to, I think the more interesting or another interesting example is, is all these products labeling themselves gluten free. Okay. And, and it's, it's fine because in fact they never had gluten in them in the first place, right? right? So they're just signaling to people that we're gluten free. And I think that's great. And, and that's not been mandated. That's, I mean, like check cereal, right? You know, says gluten free all over it. Why? They want to sell check cereal to people who have gluten allergies. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I, and yeah, the, again, that gets into like all, there's all sorts of, uh, all sorts of interesting things that you can watch by, by seeing what people are labeling now. Yeah. Um, and I mean, again, you get into, uh, I mean, people definitely worry that some of this, that some of these like allergies are a fad. Um, if you're really worried about your, your kid having a peanut allergy, like it, it doesn't really matter to you, right? Better safe than sorry. So yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it all go, it, it all kind of ties together. Um, I'm going to sort of merge two questions. I've got uh, one from Rachel says, uh, what about the belief that the cost of other people's bad dietary decisions, such as obesity, heart disease, I'm going to add smoking to the list, she didn't put it yeah. on there, are borne by all of society, which is sort of true in the States. I'm in Canada, for anybody who hasn't figured it out uh, from the way that it's it out. out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there are secret U's in all of my letters. Um, so we, we actually have um, only one in, in Ontario where I live, we have only one health insurance plan and everybody's in it. So you can't get away from paying for my decisions or not paying for my decisions because uh, I, I try to be pretty healthy. Um, <laughs> but that how does that factor in? And Heather uh, followed up by asking about what, if, and I, you can sort of tie these together. And if not, I mean, answer them separately. What about mandating levels of certain ingredients? So for instance, uh, a certain serving of, so, a maximum serving of sodium, a maximum serving of, fat or carbs. I'm, I'm expanding on her question a little bit, yeah. uh, hopefully not in an unfair way. Um, well, yeah, the first, I, mean, I, the, I think the first question, I mean, this is, a, you know, this is contingent on the world we live in, right? Which is a world in which the costs of bad health and medical decisions are, are borne by other people because we socialize the costs through various and sundry government programs, right? I mean, even in a world of, of where, well, I mean, it's an interesting question what health insurance would look like in a really market driven economy. But e even there, right, if you're, when we think about car insurance or, or, or homeowners insurance, we price risk by premiums and by people's behavior. So if you're a smoker, you know, you pay more for your homeowners insurance too, right? So, you know, or if you have a bad driving record or you're like, you know, my 22 year old son, you, you know, you're in a demographic that's more risky, right? You pay more. So, so we, we custom, we, we try to customize the cost that way. And <coughs> pro the problem with health insurance is that we can't, you know, we can't do that. And we certainly can't do it now in the States under ACA, under Obamacare. So it is true that people can, in the language of economics, externalize uh, the, the costs of, of, of their bad behavior onto, onto other, or their, you know, 
health problems onto others. The question is, what's the solution to that? If you know, is the you know, one solution obviously is to desocialize the cost, right? If if, right. if we get rid of those programs and get back to you know a, a really market-driven way of pricing health insurance and all that, or health care, different story. But if we don't, what what does that really mean? Do do we really want to add more on to the pile, as it were? What that government, you know, we're going to send government agents into your house to see what you're eating and what's in your cupboard. Right. Right to make sure that you're not imposing costs on, on, on other people right, because how far it's not, go. yeah, and it's not like you can label and pass limits and you know put maximum serving size or mat whatever, but people are going to get around it, right? If if you tell if you tell candy bar manufacturers you can't make a candy bar with more than 150 calories in it, right? Okay, I'm going to buy two, you yeah. know, or. The Bloomberg soda, right? I'm, you know, you put a maximum soda size. I'm just going to buy two small ones. I mean, people, you know, eaters going to eat, right? <laughs> people are going to people are going to do what they want to do, uh, and and I don't think you can, you know, you can provide information to help people make better choices, but in the end, there, you know, we, we I think we want a world in which people are responsible for their own choices, not a world in which other people go around telling them what they can or cannot do, um, and in the end, that you know, I mean. To be honest, the logic of well, the costs are socialized onto other people does put you in the world of you know, death panels, right? Where where somebody is allocating out from the top down healthcare and you know healthcare resources, deciding what's okay and what's not, and who's doing this, who's yeah. doing that. That's the but, the logical end for it. Right. I mean, which is uh oh, there that's a that's a whole other. <laughs> That's a whole other talk, right? Um, yes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna restrain myself there uh, because I've got so many awesome questions. Um, I think this one is really really interesting. Uh, so uh, Liz, I hope I'm saying your name right, uh, Liz. Uh, so she says she has a comment, which is nutritional labeling with specifics on ingredients have the potential to save lives, which I think we both agree with. Yeah. Uh, when you have milk, uh, her daughter has milk, dairy, and peanut allergies, yep. and these are very serious. She's been yep. hospitalized several times. She's so I think that we should discuss this though. She says economics alone would not have labels and it would allow companies to misrepresent. It, like if we didn't have a law and all we had was the economic incentives, she worries that uh, companies could uh, misrepresent what's in their food or in the Upton Sinclair uh, example, put sawdust in the meat and food. Uh, so why don't we talk about that just a little bit? Because I mean, I think that that's a common yep. concern. And it's and, and and people should know, my wife is severely lactose intolerant, yeah. and my daughter has a very bad fish and nut allergy. So I, I've lived with my wife's lactose intolerance for you know, 27 years now, uh, and and we started dating at a time when it was much. You had to look yourself to see if it yeah. didn't say allergens milk, right? It, or it would you know you'd have to know is there whey on there is there casing what is it and does it have right. Right? you have to do all this work yourself so it is I mean I I'm totally you know I I, I love the idea that information's there I, I'm not persuaded that it wouldn't be there if it weren't for mandated labeling I think as we as people as consumers get more con concerned about these things again my gluten free checks example right the, the the pressure goes on these firms to to provide information that their customers want because their customers are going to keep calling them up or going on the web and trying to find it right so now well just put it on the label and make it clear restaurants are you know uh, as far as i know restaurants are not mandated to you know indicate dishes are gluten free or not or if there's gluten in them but many restaurants now put that little gluten free symbol on there it's not the law as far as i know but they're doing it because market incentives are there so so we do see market incentives Tainting food and all that. Well, you know, Upton the, the Upton Sinclair particular example. There's some history there that we could talk about that suggests it wasn't what it seems to be. But again, why would what incentives do firms have to kill their own customers? That's the that's the ultimate question, right? Which is right. you know what why you might that that's one. Second question though is if you're claiming it's meat and it's sawdust, that's fraud. Okay, and and right. and. Anyone who, you know, thinks markets are good things like I do, agrees that fraud's wrong and that we can't, you know, fraud can't be tolerated. How best we deal with that is an interesting question. Whether you try to deal with it by mandating labels, but you know, mandating information on labels, or man, or, or passing a law that says you must, you know, say what's in there accurately, doesn't mean people don't 
still break the law. So, so right. handling it that way or through lawsuits after the fact. Just as an example, people joke about the you know the hot McDonald's coffee suit from years ago. Um, right. But have you read anything about McDonald's coffee scalding anyone that badly since then? Right. I mean those you know when when they seem over the top perhaps, and, and if you read the details of that suit, it wasn't that over the top. No, it was actually pretty serious. It was pretty serious, and it made some yeah. sense. But the result has been that people are more careful in how they you know. Uh, how they how they deal with their coffee. So so again, I think there's I think market incentives are uh, you know don't underestimate market incentives. Right. Um, okay. So I, I've got uh, Aru. I hope I'm saying your name right. Has been very patient. Um, I've been putting his question back because it kind of goes with what I wanted to sort of talk yeah. about last, um, which is how much. I mean, we've talked about experts setting constraints, um, but I think a concern that a lot of people have, especially with diet, is how much can we trust experts? Like, like we talked a little bit earlier about how confusing it can be, uh, especially when you're talking about something that we don't understand that well, you get a lot of conflicting information. And yeah. he asks about uh, the detrimental economic effects of Jane Brody declaring that egg yolks were bad for you without having any good scientific evidence right. to back up your claim. And kind of on the other, on the other hand, in the more contemporary sense, because I mean, eggs go back and forth um, a lot. I've decided to just eat them. Um, Me but, too. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it does go back and forth a lot. Yes, but on the other end of the spectrum, you've got people um, kind of, they don't want to consume something until they're really certain. Um, and a good, I mean, the best example of this is genetically modified food. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, we can, just to kind of touch back a little bit, even though people are sort of really calling for GMO labeling, you've seen a lot of no GMO labeling, which I think, I think is a, a really interesting example of, um, firms capitalizing on yeah. the fact that people would like to avoid GMOs, yeah. but uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Like, um, when the when the science doesn't seem exact, how much can we trust experts, and how much are we sort of on our own? Yeah, well, let me throw one more piece to this puzzle, which is, you know, uh, there's a lot of rent seeking going on here too, right? Oftentimes, and this is not just about food science, but all kinds of science in which people are are out. You know, the, the primary concern is our People are are they getting grants or are they getting you know NSF money or whatever it might be? So you know there's pressure to either follow a fad or come up with new results. And so again, there, there's politics in all this too, which which you know uh, is part of what we might or might not trust about about various about various experts. Um, you know, as far as the the so what so you know what do we do? Well, I think. When, when the science isn't clear, you got to go out and do a little research on your own and, and sort of figure out who you can trust. I mean, I, you know, in the GMO case, I think it's great that competitors in the market, you know, that there's a demand for GMO-free food and that people are indicating their food is GMO-free. If you think it's a, that's important, that's great. If you think it's important that your food's organic, that's great. Okay, and you let markets, let the market, you know, I think I jot, earlier jotted down. Let a thousand dinners bloom, right? <laughs> let 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 people, you know, put options out there. You know, I think with, in the case of GMOs, I'll just note, as far as I know, the science, the science is pretty clear that GMOs aren't a big deal, aren't you know, aren't a big problem. All right, but again, it science could be wrong, and if you think it's wrong, and if you want something else, you know, if you if you want to know that your food GMO free, keep asking for it. You're going to get it just like the gluten-free folks are. On the other hand, if you're me and you think, you know, uh, GMOs uh, are great and they're no different from, from the way in which farmers have manipulated crops for thousands of years, bring it on. I don't care if it's, you know, I think, but it, it's the mandating of the labels that suggests that, that there's an answer here. And what's interesting, right, is the people who are skeptical about GMOs want to mandate labeling. The people who, like me, who think GMOs are fine, we, we don't want a label that says, this has GMOs in it. It's fine, right? right. You know, so so there, you should choose. I'm perfectly fine with you persuading sellers to sort of label things as being GMO free. Um, what I'm not okay with is when you want to take away the option of me choosing the things that have GMOs in, or more relevantly, making the kinds of uh, uh, crops that, GM, that, are, that the kinds of food that GMO makes available available to poor people who really need it. Right, because that's ultimately the issue here, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, sorry, guys. I've got an itchy uh, poll finger. I wanted to launch our last poll when uh, Steve was done talking, and I right. think we're only going to. 
Uh, only going to be able to take one more question, unfortunately. Uh, luckily, you guys have asked questions right along the lines of uh, what I wanted to talk about, so I've just been going with it, and it's been awesome. I, I hope that we get this kind of participation in the future. Um, so I, I've got Ken has asked, on labeling laws, do we not run into the problem of what should and shouldn't be the law, and who decides what the law should be? Right. Um, he's got some examples uh, about beer. Uh, there are contradictory labeling laws for beer in different jurisdictions, which of yep. course could be used, um, I'm, I'm ex uh, expanding a little bit, but that could be used to try and keep, um, and it has been used, there's a fee webinar about this, uh, to keep beer co competitors from coming yep. in. Uh, yeah. to a, a new place. Uh, policymakers yeah. have the same goal, but come up with the different regulations. Um, so that, let's talk a little bit about that. And um, I'm really sorry, guys. There are so many awesome questions. I will do my best to follow up with anybody whose question we haven't got to, but I, do, I also don't want to uh, take up too much of your time tonight, Let, even I mean, though it's been really fun for me. Yeah, we can go a little bit past eight if, if we have the availability. But but just on the on the labeling thing, there's no question that labeling is wide open for rent seeking, right? Um, the idea of what you want to label, how you want to label it, uh, will will attract people with you know who want to shut com competitors out. Even going back to the history of, in the United States of the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906, one of the main drivers behind that was a guy named Harvey Wiley, who was a whiskey manufacturer who wanted to use the law. To, to make to declare certain kinds of uh, other kinds of whiskeys like rye, for example, to be impure compared to his. I think he was a bourbon manufacturer. I can't remember, but whatever it was, he wanted he he saw it as a way to label his competition as impure. So even from the very beginning, this sort of note, you know, Pure Food and Drug Act, which we think of as being so you know clean in terms of of, of rent seeking, had a rent seeking component to it. So absolutely, labeling you know labeling laws give people an opportunity to get their that thing on there in the way that benefits them. And, and often they are being written not by the scientists or the dietitians, uh, but by the politicians and the lobbyists. Yeah, definitely. Um, just so everybody knows, I will close this. Uh, most of you have voted. I actually didn't let you guys know where we stood on the second one. Uh, the second poll was, are there diet rules that ought to be followed by everybody? We had a few people that said, yes, we understand diet well enough to set the rules. Uh, medium number of people who said there are some set rules and how we apply them will vary. And then the most people uh, say that each person sets their own rules for a healthy diet. Um, and for our last poll, which I just closed, um, you will recognize this question from the registration. I'm, I'm just curious to see how you guys uh, move, but don't worry, I won't, I won't out you. Um, we've got a few people who believe that individuals can make their own decisions with research and they don't need to consult experts. Um, a large number of people, relatively speaking, uh, that believe that expert advice is valuable to inform our decisions, but those decisions should be left up to us. And a few people that say expert consensus should be used to write laws. Uh, they believe that, you know, we're pretty sure on a few of these things. And as we kind of touched on, um, there's some arguments uh, for cases in which we might want to worry about these things in such a way that we involve the government. So, I mean, we can definitely uh, we can definitely talk about that. I'm so sorry that I didn't get to all of your great questions. Um, this has been amazing. I've got a, a, a lot of questions that are similar. Um, so I've just brought up some information and normally I would have I would have shared a uh, an article that I thought you guys would find interesting, but I didn't have one that was obvious. Uh, but I've had so many questions on labeling and incentives for safety that people face in the markets that I'm going to dig up um, yeah. one or two articles on that for you guys. And I will send it out. I send out one email after these events. Don't worry. This isn't like the beginning of a torrent of, uh, of communication from me. Um, I, will, I will definitely try to do that. And I will review any questions that we haven't got to. And if I think that I can provide a good answer, then I will follow up with you guys uh, by email directly. And I'm uh, just so going to put a... Put a quick plug in for the next one with Pierre. Uh, if you're interested yeah. in these questions, you should definitely be here in two weeks or three weeks, whatever that is. Yeah, it, it'll be about three weeks. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Pierre Desrochers, who is a professor of geography. Uh, food geography is a job that I didn't know existed before I met Pierre. Um, I have some like regrets in my life now, because some of Pierre's job is actually traveling around and eating food from different parts of the world, which basically sounds like the best thing ever. <laughs> um, but Pierre's written a great book called The Locavore's Dilemma, um, and he's talking about the 100-mile diet uh, and different uh, ideas about eating local and organic. And so we're going to talk about um, the ways in which a global food supply have helped us out. Uh, so 
please, uh, if you are available, uh, come and join us again and ask some more of your great questions. Uh, and I wanted to kind of draw attention also, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, Steve posts about it all the time. I'm not joking when I say that the man loves food and so do I. Uh, you can follow his page on Facebook and uh, keep up to date with any work that he's doing. I've got the link up there. You can also follow Big Ideas Live on Facebook and I will let you know via that uh, route about any upcoming events um, which hopefully you will find interesting. If you have any questions uh, or comments about today's event or future events, or there may be topics that you'd like to see covered, you can contact me at jnielsen at fee.org. Uh, that's what that's there for. So I want to thank you again, everybody, for participating yep. tonight. Thanks, uh, and thanks to Steve for coming out. My pleasure. <laughs>